so that we have so that we have this recording for our YouTube for others that weren't able to join us tonight. So again, welcome to Rise Up's workshop on navigating college life. And I'm going to let Katie introduce herself now. Thank you again for being here, Katie. I greatly appreciate it. Hi, guys. And as uh, Ms. Katie said, I'm Katie Chrysler. I'll be presenting on navigating college life. I graduated, I graduated high school uh, just a little bit ago in May 2021 with a high school diploma and a general associate's degree. I'm currently a political science pre-law student in TSU, Middle Tennessee State University, and I'm minoring in honors of international relations. I'm a little bit weird, I'm a freshman by year and a junior by credit, which means I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a young, but I'm in older classes. And I'm currently interning at Thomas Rogers, which is a lot of American history and business for us. Okay, so let's get into this. So to get to college, you have to apply. So we're going to start by talking about the application process. Now, if you are a senior or junior, you might know just how chaotic and confusing the application process is. Okay, so to start with the application process, you want to figure out how many schools to apply to. You want to apply to two reach or dream schools. These are schools that you really, really want to go to, but you might not get into. To target or match schools, these are schools that you probably will get into. They're pretty good, it's likely you'll get into. It's a pretty good match. And then to safety schools. These safety schools are shoo You're gonna get into them. There's no way you won't get into them. And if you wanna apply to 242, which is a total of eight schools, making sure you have a widespread of schools you apply to. And that can make it so you can field authors and scholarship, uh, scholarships and financial aid and pick the one that's best for you. Personally, I only apply to, let's see, four schools uh, because that's what worked best for me but this is what is generally recommended by most uh, big college board programs okay the next step of the campus application the college application process is the campus visit or the campus tour you can do this in person or virtual um, I, my junior year, senior year was like the birth of COVID, so I got to do all my tours virtually, but in-person tours are also great. I'm actually uh, interviewing to be a tour guide at MTSU this coming week, so I recommend that you go to a campus and you visit and you see the tour and you do the visit, because you really, you don't want to miss out on that on the ground feel. Because I don't know about you, but you kind of just know what school you're meant to go to when you walk in and you just feel Yes, this is where I'm meant to be. So once you do, you find your target, you find your match, you find your safe schools. Once you go see those tours, you go on those visits, then you have to figure out the requirements and the deadlines. And trust me, there's a lot of them. So first you want to take note of all the deadlines requirement for each school. You can use this nifty nifty college tracker spreadsheet, which I'll make sure this PowerPoint is shared and available so you guys can all click on that link and find the spreadsheet. And then you also want to figure out when the deadlines are. These are only some of the deadlines there may be. But there are four different ways that you can apply to college. You can do early decision. Regular decision, actually just five. I totally miscounted. There's regular decision, early decision, early action, and rolling decision. So regular decision is what most people do. It's what I did. It's when deadlines are typically between uh, late November and early March. And then there's early decision, which is binding. And there's uh, early action, which is non-binding. And there's rolling admissions, which means that it kind of rolls on until like the school year begins. But he, first come, first serve. Typically, schools will fill out their entire accepting class by probably like June or July. So you want you want to go to a school, you need to try and get as early as possible. But to roll into those terms a little bit more, early decision is you must attend that college if you're accepted, unless the financial package is lacking or insufficient. Uh, this on the author two rounds. 
months, which is EV1, EV2, one fall, the other winter. EV2 will give you more time to prepare a stronger application packet, so it might be better for you in that, in that situation you find yourself in. Early action. So as I said earlier, early decision is binding. You must go to that school if you're accepted. Early action, you don't have to go to that school if you're accepted. You have until May 1st, which is typically called, I forget the exact word, but basically like the day you choose your college if you haven't already. And you have until May 1st to choose which college to attend. And this makes it easy to explore more financial aid packets from other schools. Here's a, a nifty, nifty chart to kind of just summarize what I just said. I did regular decision uh, because I am very much a person who likes the phrase early bird gets the worm. I applied to all of my schools the second the application opened. Actually, I was trying to apply in like June, uh, which most applications don't open until August, fun fact. Um, but I was the person who was like jumping in there, applying first thing, because I was so nervous that I was going to be late. Turns out I had like four months of wiggle room. Okay. So the next step of the application process, or more to be fair, this step can be put anywhere in the application process, but it's very important. Take standardized tests. I know, I know, no one likes them. Everyone hates them. They're awful, they suck. Why do they exist? But they're important. They're really good for colleges. They say it is meant to gauge like where you know, what you know. I say it gauges how good you are taking tests because there are really, really smart people who did awful on the ACT. And there are some average people who did phenomenal on the ACT. And it just is how you take tests. And so you want to, you're going to take the SAT or the ACT this spring of your junior year. Most people take the ACT because that's the standard. In fact, Tennessee State has like a state law where all Tennessee juniors are required, it's a mandatory, to take a free ACT in the spring of their junior year, which coincidentally, mine was actually pushed to the fall of my senior year because of COVID. I went on spring break, was supposed to take the ACT afterwards, and we never went back. But you want to take it as early as possible so you can improve your improve it time and time again. And there are those who have, have a financial risk and can't take the ACT multiple times because it does cost a lot of money. The junior ACT is mandatory and free. And then the Tennessee school, Tennessee does offer a optional ACT for seniors in the fall of their senior year. So if you're not happy with that junior ACT score, you can take it again in your senior year. And then you want to make sure if you're not taking it with your school, you want to make sure you register for the ACT or the SAT at least a month before the test is due testing day to avoid late registration fees because it's already expensive. You don't need to add more money to it. And then over here we have take and placement exams. So AP. You probably have heard about AP tests. Uh, they're like the bay of most kids, uh, kind of stuff. But if you have the opportunity and you think you can do it, take an AP class, pass the test. And depending on your school, if you score a four or a five, you can earn, you can earn college credit for certain first year courses. I actually took AP World History my sophomore year and got two uh, course credits out of it. Of course, now the uh, AP College Board has changed that class to make it so you can't get two credits, which sucks. I was the very last class that was able to get two credits for it. But I still highly recommend you take AP, AP classes. And next, you have to apply for financial aid. You have to get that one. It's like the biggest thing they tell you in college, which is kind of like shouted at you. Fill out the RASPA, fill out the RASPA all the time. And this, the FAFSA opens October 1st every year, and you fill it out every year. If you're going to college, fill it out. And this is something that happens every year. Every year, October 1st. You go to the website, you fill it out. And then you also want to apply for application fee waivers. If you are in a financial situation where you can't, you can't pay for all these application fees, which range from 
$25 to $150, then you can apply for a fee, a fee waiver or your guidance counselor can apply for a fee waiver. Um, I've also heard about students who know that their ACT scores are higher than the average admitted person. And so they'll call and be like, my ACT score is a 27. You typically admit people who have 22s. Because of this, would you mind waiving my application fee? And apparently that works. I did not do that because I was scared and didn't want to like, I was very non-confrontational and just like, I'll just pay, I'll just pay. But I encourage you to go ahead and do that phone call. Because the worst thing they can tell you is no. And then also complete scholarship applications. You can do this through the school because a lot of schools have school specific uh, scholarships. School specific scholarships. You can also do that during your department, like the Physical Science Department and TCU has departmental scholarships. Or you can use some like nifty websites like Nitro and like scholarships like 100. There's a ton of them. Search scholarships. There's going to be like 1,200 web pages that come up. And you can use some of those to apply for scholarships as well. And now the part that everyone loves. It's the favorite part of everyone who's ever applied for college. Write college application essays. So fun. It's, ju it's July. It's brilliant. So the very first thing you want to do is write your main college admissions essay. This is the one that you're going to go to. You're going to send to most schools. You might have to tailor it a little bit, but it's the one that's like, what is like the one that they say, submit an essay. This is what you submit. Uh, you can also write departmental essays. And those typically are, why this college? Why do you want to go here? And those you write after the fact, and these are very, very, very skewed towards the school that's like, asking for it. So like I filled out one third one of the schools I applied to, and I had to like be like, when I first stepped foot on your campus, I was amazed by the blah 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 blah. It's very skewed towards that school. So don't reuse them or they're going to reuse them proofread them and make sure the other school's name is not mentioned but trust me people do do that and then finally you want to revise your essays and get feedback by august or september of your senior year of high school you want to get feedback from two to three people on those essays very important get feedback to get them proofread Changed. 
And then you always want to use a simple standard font like Times New Roman and format spacing to 1.5 or double space. And always make sure you're within the word limit. The worst thing possible is to upload an essay that is over the word limit and then they can't even see half of it. Or to be under the word limit and then you just kind of look a little, a little lazy. So it's like, if it's like the word limit 600 and you just like turn it and it's like 300. You just look like you just didn't really apply yourself and that's going to be a very easy way to go, no, we don't want you. Send your high school transcripts and test scores. So colleges need your transcripts and your test scores to make an educated decision on whether they want to accept you or not. And so the transcript, that's on your counselor, that's on your school. You just email or call your school and ask them to send it to the correct schools. The ACT, the SAT, and the AP scores, most of the time, those can be sent directly when you're taking the test. There's like a little part before the test where you fill out a form and you can choose three schools to get it sent to, especially on the ACT. Uh, it sucks if you're taking those and you don't know what schools you want to go to. And those three schools are sent for free, the rest you have to pay for. And some schools will let you self-report, but most want that official score report from the organization, which means you have to pay that fee and get them sent to the school officially. Request letters of recommendation. So I think I applied to a total of one school that wore the letters of recommendation. Uh, I won't tell you which one, but it's not the one I'm going to. And uh, most many schools require one to two letters of recommendation. You just have like a list in your brain of people to ask if they're ever told. If you're gonna need a recommendation for that. You just have like a list in your brain. Like what's a good teacher who could like tell people how good I am in class? Or like, is my coach able to tell that I'm a dedicated player? Like, what is what are people who are people in my life that can speak to how good a student I am, how dedicated I am, how much of a leader I am? And you should officially uh, or unofficially notify these teachers or counselors at uh, the end of your junior year, beginning of your senior year. You should like let them know that you're going to call on them for those recommendation letters. And then once you've completed your portion of the online application, there should be like this little button that says. Uh, send recommendation request and they'll get an email they'll fill out the form etc and then you just want to like make sure they fill out the letter and like submit it before the deadline and so really it's just making sure you have good relationships with teachers coaches uh, religious education leaders etc you just want to make sure you are prepared and you know what you're asking for write your resume so some colleges require this some don't I applied to absolutely zero schools that required my resume. But now that I'm in college, I have actually submitted my resume quite a bit. So there here is an example of one of my resumes. I have two, one that I wrote before college, one that I wrote in college. This is the in college one. But you wanna make sure you might have a little work experience. So you're gonna highlight your academic career. Academic achievements, awards,
So they will see your grades and they can make the decision to not let you go to school there anymore if your grades drop rapidly. Stay in the loop. Read your email. I will be rather shocked by the amount of people who are in college who don't read their email. That's the primary way colleges communicate with you. I get like 40 emails a day. It's annoying, but it's like the only way they can communicate with you. So stay in the loop, read your email, check in your mail. Just be aware of ways they might try and communicate with you. Disconnect. Don't stare agonizingly at the little, where application is being processed. A watch pot never boils. You will not get that accepted screen if you just keep watching it and refreshing the page. It won't happen. I know there's like a scene in like Kissing Booth 3 or something that has that, like, don't be that, don't do that. A refreshing the page will not make the decision happen quicker. So just disconnect. Be aware of communication because you don't need to stare at the website all the time. Keep tabs on your social media accounts because colleges do check your social media. They will check it. So don't post anything you don't want grandma to see. If you don't want grandma seeing it, don't post it. Because the internet is permanent. And even if you delete something, it's still out there. And then once you're accepted, finish the process to becoming an incoming freshman. Now, this differs from the school to school, but in GSU's incoming freshman student checklist looks like this. And if you're like me, and really like lists, and this was very helpful because it tells you exactly what you need to do. You might need to acquire their housing. You might need to register their custom, which is our freshman orientation. You might need to pay fees and confirm your class schedule. And most schools have a mini checklist like this on their website. In fact, if you, there's usually, on the MTSU website at least, there's a mini nifty of five button up on the very top. Once you click on that, you get this nifty nifty options, and you can schedule a visit. You can find the date the deadline, which is where this checklist, checklist comes from. You can do essentially anything on this website. And college application, college website can be difficult to navigate, but in MTSUs is like the most user-friendly you can find. But typically, if you search hard enough, and yes, there is a search function on most the college website, you will find a checklist that looks like this. Okay, no, you have finally made it. You have graduated high school. You have been accepted to college. You are in college classes. But how do you succeed in college? You read the syllabus. This is like the most straightforward point I can ever tell you. Read the syllabus. It is so important to read the syllabus. It's like a contract between you and the professor. They tell you what they expect of you and you, they tell it also tells you what to expect from them. It's the most straightforward thing you can do. Just read it. It's probably like three pages. So read the syllabus. I feel like I'm talking in that voice of like, honey, where is my super suit? Just imagine that, but read the syllabus. Also, go to class and attend office hours. So you actually have to attend class, to pass class. It's like the city that you think, like there's actually like a direct correlation to like attendance and passing class. Seriously, trust me. Like I accidentally missed like three classes and now I have a B, which is my own fault. But yes, attending class is important, even if the professor tells you they don't take attendance. Because even if they don't take attendance, they still see if you're not there or not. I mean, you walk into a classroom, there's three students. They can tell half of the class isn't there. So attend regularly. It will make professors like you more. And attend office hours. It's a great way to get additional help and to build a relationship or rapport with the professor. That's also a great way to get letters of recommendation because you will need them when you go on to a job or an internship or something else. 
participate and engage in class. Don't just go to class. Participate, engage. What's the point of being in class if you're just gonna sit there going, you can't see me. If I don't make eye contact, then I'm not here. You cannot, you can't call on me. You can't ask questions. Are you showing up to class prepared to put a meaningful thought in your work? That means reading, assigned reading before you go to class, not the night before the test. Trust me, reading, so reading the readings is helpful. It makes so you actually understand what's happening in class. Pay attention and take notes. I actually previously did a presentation on studying and taking notes, which I totally stole some of the slides from. So if you weren't there, you might see some repeat slides. But it's not only important to pay attention in class, but it's especially important that you pay attention and take notes. But paying attention to being an active participant in the learning process. This can help you complete homework more easily. Taking notes is important because you can refer to topics discussed during class later on. Take effective notes. Come prepared. Read the reading. Actively listen. Focus on key words, concept, concepts, and formulate your notes, series of questions. And don't forget to review your notes. Don't just like cram them in a binder or notebook somewhere or another and look at them again before the test. Like just read them like immediately after the class. So if you might have like a question or something, like let's say like you're studying for the test and like you look back at the notes and you're just like, what the what the crap does AR mean? This entire lecture note just has AR written everywhere. I don't know what it means. Don't let that be you. Either at the beginning, write shorthand at the very top of your page, go AR stands for, I have no idea what the abbreviation AR could stand for, but just like tell them. Like, let's say like you abbreviate like A blink into AL in your notes, like make a note at the top like AL means Abraham Lincoln. So just like you know. Because otherwise, three months later, you're going to be super lost. You're just not going to know what's happening. You're just going to be like, so I'm sitting through the final. And apparently, three months ago, I knew what AL stands for. But now I don't. And then, different ways to take notes. This is one of my reviews slides. You've probably seen it before. There are three ways to take notes. I'm sure there are more, but there are three main ways. And this is paper. Computer and iPad. My personal favorite is paper. I'm the person who like shows his glass and has like 12 other color pins and like 13 other color markers. Like genuinely also in the very front row just have like art supplies. I mean, I have ADHD. So sometimes the only way for me to be able to focus the class is to like focus on making my notes for the art project. Make it as pretty as possible and all remove the information. There are different types of notes. Here's an example of my very colorful paper notes. That, this was for my senior year of high school when I took an econ macroeconomics. Not the funnest class on the, on the planet, but also not the worst. Sadly, I dropped water on my notes, so they're smudged. It's the one downside to using colored markers and pins. They can be terribly destroyed by water. This is an example of computer notes. These are actually from my junior year when I took U.S. History 2. Fun fact, this is about the Patriots and how they were protesting during the Revolutionary War. And then this is an example of iPad notes. This is from personal finance, and it's not from me. This is my best friend's notes from our first junior year, my senior year, of a personal finance class. Well, there's many different ways to take notes, and maybe your handwriting is a little bit prettier. You don't have as many utensils or a computer or an iPad. You can still take good notes. You don't need all these things, but these things work through me and they work through my friends. So really, just find what works through you and take notes that way. Study effectively. Have a growth mindset. Think positively and accept challenges. You want to prioritize. What is the most important at that moment, on that day, at, on that week? 
and how much are our assignments worth and what are they due? If you have something that's due on the same day, two things that are due on the same day, one is worth 25% of one of your course grades. The other one, 10 points, and the long run, it affects nothing. Which one should you spend more time doing? The 25% one? I agree. You should totally focus more on the one that's 25% of your grade as the one that's maybe, maybe 2% of your grade. Prioritize. And then choose your study time for patient and circumstances wisely. If you are easily distracted, it's probably not the best idea to go and try and study in the cafeteria at noon. Probably not the best idea. You know what is a good idea? Going to the library at like 4 p.m. and like choosing like one of the private study rooms or going to like a quiet floor. Like you might actually get some work done then. And then practice testing yourself. Use flashcards. Use Quizlet. Review, 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 review. <laughs> and then my readers, I already knew what I was going to say. Review the notes, the homework, and the test. When studying, it's important that you review your notes as well as past homework and tests. By reviewing your notes, you're revisiting past concepts and you can truly learn. By reviewing past homework and tests or quizzes, you're able to target exactly what you make mistakes on. I just spent like the past four days doing this because I have a midterm when I come back from spring break. Practice and review. Practice and review using the following. This is not limiting it. There are more ways to practice and review than what I've listed. These are some ways to kind of be a flow in your brain and then thinking about what you could be doing. Flashcards. I'm not even going to try and say that word. I'm not going to try. It basically means, like, you know, like how you remember North, East, Southwest, Nether, East, Sour, Watermelon, Nether, East, Selfie Waffles, things like that. Make things like that up so you just. It's easy, it's funny. Trust me, you will remember things that are just so stupid or so funny, it is sticking your brain. Thank you. Quizlet, which is like flashcards. Take practice tests, and let you just actually do the in practice quizzes or practice tests, and then rewrite your notes. I know no one likes writing lines or writing vocabulary words, but trust me, you actually do remember it if you rewrite it. Ever. Don't do it. Don't do it. Cut yourself off at like 8 p.m. max. Get a good night's sleep. Don't have caffeine close to bedtime. And get at least eight hours of sleep before the test. Trust me, I'm awful at this. I'm awful at going to bed early. I'm awful at it. But trust me, it's really helpful if you do it. Do what you got wrong. Two, talk to your teacher if you have any questions. And if your grade is lower than you want it to be, ask if you can do an extra credit project. And four, this one's optional. If the extra credit is possible, ask if tutoring is available. Organize and use time wisely. Manage your time with intention. Maintain a schedule and have no more than space. Develop time management strategies such as using a calendar, to do lists, and doing work incrementally instead of doing it all at once. The way I do this is I write down everything in the semester, and then each month I write down everything due to the month. And then each week I write down everything due that week, and then each day I write down everything that I either need to do that day or everything that is due that day. Funny, I just said two different do's in the same sentence. Hopefully, no one's confused. But it's just really important to know what's due and know what it is due. Analyze your learning style. Basically, like, are you a visual learner? Do you learn better when you hear it? Do you learn better when you see it? Do you learn better when you write it? 
you learn better when you like write it multiple times and you read it multiple times. Figure out what's the best way you learn. And then you can cater your studying habits or your working environment to that. This is especially helpful if you have ADD or ADHD or some other neurodiversity like I do, I have ADHD. And these are some tips. These don't work for everyone. Trust me, I try half of these and they don't work for me. Like I really recently, my best way for me to do homework was to play a podcast while I did the homework. To anyone else, that might sound like chaotic noise. To me, it was the only way to make my brain focus on what we had to do. And other things are building a routine, giving yourself additional time to study, taking breaks, rewriting notes, staying stimulated by writing in the margins, highlighting, reading out loud, and keeping up with to-do lists. Practice wise money management. Set and maintain a budget. Fit it in seek scholarships and visit your school's financial aid department or website. They all have one. They all will help you. If you have questions or you're confused or you need help, ask for it. You can't get help until you ask for help. And sometimes the biggest barrier to getting help is asking. Because asking can be really, really hard. But you have to do it. You have to ask for help. Get involved. It's not just going to class. The best way to succeed in college is to get involved. Go to campus events, join clubs, meet with teachers, talk to your professors, to your deans. Students who feel like they belong and are supported are more successful in college. But also don't like overextend yourself. Like you don't need to join five clubs to be involved. You can join like two. Try new things. As I already said, academic success isn't the only measure of success in college. Another measure of success is experience. And take advantage of the wide range of courses offered at your school. Use your electives to explore, explore your horizons. Take a minor in a passion subject. It doesn't have to be something you think will give you a good job. Maybe you want to be an astronaut. Or maybe you want to be a bathroom designer. You can major in that, and then you can also minor in like history or English or something that you just love. Maintain a social balance. Never heard of work-life balance, which is the same thing. It's really, really hard. Because sometimes you just you're just kind of like, but I have so much to do. I don't I don't have time for my friends. I don't have time for my family. But you can only have time if you like make time, like if you work them into your schedule, if you purposely set aside time. So maintain that social balance. You want to balance social life. If you have a classmate, like you don't have to like take out time or like take out time of your study, study together, work together to get towards that good grades for that exam. Uh, form partnerships and relationships. Even after you graduate, those college friendships, those college partnerships, are going to be some of the best bonds in your entire life. Identify your goals and values. Acknowledging your goals can be one way to visualize your vision of vision and success. Set your goals. Figure out what your values are and then accomplish them. You want to translate those long-term goals into short-term plans. So maybe you want to be the president of the United States. Well, let's start with a smaller goal. Let's say the smaller goal is getting into a good law school. So then you understand how to accomplish the getting into a good law school. And you can do this by establishing a SMART goal. A SMART goal is specific. I divide your tasks. Getting into a good law school. Measurable. Sort of how you can measure your goal. Well, I can measure getting into a good law school by finding a school that is ranked as one of the best law schools in the country. And that's how I know that I see my goal because I'll be in one of the best law schools in the country. Achievable. Create realistic goals that you have some control over. 
I can control whether I get into a good law school because I can control my grades, my GPA, my experience, etc. I can control those things. And that's relevant. Focus on goals that will guide your future or your idea of success. So going to a good law school is a good plan to become president because lots of presidents go to good law schools. And then time bound. Set a deadline for yourself to stay on task. So I get into a good law school, which means I need to stay, I need to have good grades all my throughout college. I need to apply to my good law school by this uh, this summer, I think summer or spring. It, the application opens like normal normal college opens. So if I want to get into a good law school, I need to apply in late summer or fall of that year. A smart goal can help you stay focused and achieve your ultimate goal in a manageable way. And you want you don't have full control over your grade, a smart goal might be my goal is to start every weekday with one hour of additional study in the first three weeks of class. Like you might even not be able to control your grade, but you can control how much work or effort you put into getting those grades. And here are some resources and some articles you might find helpful. And I'm done. Were there any questions that were posed in the chat that I can answer? Do you have any questions now? Yes. What does ACT stand for? What does ACT stand for? Um, I honestly don't know. I want to guess advanced college test, but that's probably very wrong. I recommend Googling it. Advanced College Placement Test. Ha ha ha, I didn't even know that. What's SAT? SAT? I definitely don't know that one. Yes. Does it take longer to take the real ACT instead of the pre-ACT? Does it take longer to take the real ACT instead of the uh, pre-ACT? Yes. yes. It does. I don't know the exact timing on that, but I've taken both, and I know for a fact the actual ACT is longer. Do you have something to do with that ACT question? I was just going to say the scholastic test was SAT. I'm sorry. The scholastic aptitude test and the ACT will grade everything that's done. Um, but not get any points off if you get something wrong. So you wanna answer everything. On the SAT test, they don't do that. They grade everything that's right and wrong. So you don't wanna just fill in any answer. And with the SAT, I know the ACT, they uh, typically recommend you pick a letter. So like, uh, like there's some, like you don't wanna just fill in willy nilly and you don't have the answer. You want to just go through and be like, I'm going to pick B. And there's a good chance like 25% of those answers are going to be Bs. If you just change your answer, you're, you're probably going to get them all wrong. But if you stick through an entire section with just B, you have, a good, you have a better chance of getting some of those right on the ACT. Anybody have any more questions? In person, virtual? This concludes then our evening's workshop. Thank you so much for those of you in person and virtually for joining us tonight. This, if you missed any of it, um, again, Katie has um, shared the slideshow with me. So the um, resources and the different links she had in her slideshow, I can send to you. You can email me. Uh, it will also be posted on our YouTube page. So you can look at it again and get something that way like too if you'd like. So thank you again for everyone and thank you again Katie for your time and sharing with us tonight and practicing with us. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Good night.